Doncs molt bé, bona tarda. Sigueu molt benvinguts i benvingudes a aquest primer cicle de la Càtedra Verdaguer d'Estudis Literaris de la Universitat de Vic, Universitat Central de Catalunya, dedicat al tema del viatge i específicament en el que hem anomenat el viatge experiencial. Recordeu que aquesta sessió s'enregistra, per tant, és possible que us demanin permís a cada un dels participants. La qüestió escollida s'inscriu en una línia de recerca de la universitat que interessa tant a la càtedra Verdaguer, el viatge vist des de la perspectiva dels estudis literaris, com també els grups de recerca de la nostra universitat que s'aproximen al viatge des dels àmbits de la geografia literària, des de l'estudi històrico-literari o des de la perspectiva de gènere. Concretament, es tracta dels grups de recerca, textos literaris contemporanis, estudi, edició i traducció, i del grup d'estudis de gènere, traducció, literatura, història i comunicació. Cadascuna de les tres sessions amb què comptarà el cicle vol centrar-se en mirades diferents sobre el tema del viatge experiencial. Així, es convoca a reflexionar sobre les transposicions del jo en el territori sobre les petjades de les escriptores viatgeres catalanes i sobre la geografia i el paisatge vistos des dels sentiments i l'interior dels escriptors. L'activitat que avui presentem ha estat possible gràcies a la col·laboració entre la Càtedra Verdaguer d'Estudis Literaris, els grups de recerca abans esmentats, la Facultat d'Educació, Traducció, Esports i Psicologia i ha comptat amb l'ajut del Departament de Cultura de la Generalitat de Catalunya per a projectes de difusió de la recerca en l'àmbit de les lletres. En aquesta primera trobada entrevistarem el conegut i reconegut internacionalment escriptor, assagista, editor, periodista, crític i professor de literatura comparada Colm Toivin. Vagi per endavant un agraïment molt sincer a la seva excel·lent disposició a participar en aquesta activitat de recerca des de la seva residència a Los Àngeles. Malgrat que el senyor Toivin entén perfectament i parla el català, a l'hora de la conversa passarem a l'anglès perquè així pugui expressar-se amb més comoditat. Si em permeten, començarem tot fent un repàs molt breu de la figura de Colm Toivin. Toivin ha publicat deu novel·les, entre les quals figuren títols tan coneguts com The South, The Blackwater Lightship, The Master, Brooklyn, Nora Webster o la seva darrera obra, The Magician. Dos reculls de narrativa curta, dues històries curtes i un nombre molt rellevant de llibres d'assaig i altres. Per la seva tasca d'escriptor, Toivin ha rebut multitud de premis i reconeixements. Colm Toivin va néixer a Enniscorthy, a la República d'Irlanda. Va estudiar al University College de Dublín i es va graduar en Història i el mateix any de la seva graduació, a l'edat de 20 anys, va viatjar a Barcelona, on va viure del 1975 al 1978, durant els convulsius anys del postfranquisme. L'interès de Toivin per tot allò que succeïa al nostre país durant aquells anys en què la ciutat vivia un despertar a tots nivells, polític, social, artístic, sexual, va portar-lo a crear un lligam molt estret amb Catalunya. Gran coneixedor de la nostra història, de la nostra política, de la llengua, art, arquitectura, costums i tradicions, el portar a escriure amb una clara picada d'ullet a l'homenatge a Catalunya de George Orwell, el seu Homage to Barcelona, publicat el 1990 en anglès i més tard el 2003 en català. Aquest llibre, Homage to Barcelona, malgrat el que pugui suggerir el títol, no es limita a parlar de Barcelona i ens demostra un coneixement molt ampli de la geografia, la societat catalana i les formes de vida més enllà de la metròpolis. Em consta que per a Colm Toivin 
George Orwell va ser un referent a l'hora de conèixer Catalunya, però a mi en particular la seva obra localitzada a Catalunya em recorden molts aspectes a les obres de John Langdon Davis, coetani d'Orwell. De fet, des de Langdon Davis costaria trobar algun escriptor en llengua anglesa que mostri un coneixement, una empatia i una profunditat d'anàlisi del nostre país com la que mostra Tom Toivi. És precisament a partir del seu llibre, Homenatge a Barcelona, i del llibre que va escriure el seu amic Bernard Lockland, In the High Pyrenees, publicat el 2003, que podem reconstruir de forma força curada les primeres passes de Colm Toivin a Catalunya, les seves impressions del país i el descobriment que va fer del Pirineu català, i molt especialment de Ferrera de Pallars. Tan especial fou la seva descoberta del Pallars Sobirà que a Ferrera mateix va comprar una casa per passar-hi temporades. El Pallars, de fet, hi situa tres obres. Una novel·la, The South, i dues històries curtes, A Long Winter, publicat a la col·lecció Mothers and Sons, el 2006, i un altre conte curt, Summer of 38, publicat al seminari New Yorker el 4 de març de 2013. Avui hem demanat a Colm Toivin de parlar precisament del procés creatiu, de com vincula la seva Irlanda natal amb la cultura pirinenca i de com el jo escriptor crea espais de trobada cultural catalano-irlandesa. Deixarem al final de la conversa uns minuts per si els participants volen fer-li alguna pregunta a través del xat. Good afternoon from Vic, Mr. Toivin, and good, afternoon. And good, good morning, morning in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. So, well, thank you very much, uh, and we appreciate your availability uh, to participate in this interview as an activity of research of our university. Well, first, I would like to, 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 uh, to refer to Bernard Locklin, I mentioned before, uh, who explains in his book, In the High Pyrenees, that you reached Ferrera for the first time with the Alzina Graells, together with him and his friend, Mary Rogan, in the mid seventies. In homage to Barcelona, you describe it like this. The landscape was dramatic and exciting, and there was a sense of being cut off from the real world. No one would come here without a good reason. Well, what was the good reason which encouraged you to set up or to set your first novel, The South, in the Catalan Pyrenees and start a career as a fiction writer? Um, I think 1975, 1976 were years in which young people, I mean, people, I was 20, 21, but I mean, people in Barcelona who were that same age, simply wanted to cut their ties with the past, with what the lives their parents had lived. It wasn't just political, it was personal. In other words, people found studies at university to be too tedious, too tied in to rules and regulations, and they wanted to find somewhere else to be and some other way of living. And Ferreira de Pallars at the time was almost empty. Every house, with the exception of two or three, were empty. And, and the, a big system began of trying to track down the people, usually in Lleida or in La Seu or in Andorra or Barcelona, who owned these houses, and to try and rent them at a very low rent, so that everyone else called the people hippies. In other words, the village below Burg was lived in still by people who were born in Burg and who worked locally, who had farms, or had other things to do in Borg. It was the same in Tirbia, but Ferreira was different. Ferreira, the houses were bigger and the view was astonishing, certainly for me, of the Pyrenees, of, of the full, you know, full line of the Pyrenees, um, sometimes seeming distant, sometimes in the light seeming close. So Ferreira became a dream place, became a 
a place that people went to, I suppose, in search of um, a sort of freedom. And as I say, it wasn't necessarily a political freedom, although everyone was, of course, in favour of political freedom. But it was it was something much more personal. And it was almost like why people went to Woodstock or why people came to California. And so um, Bernard, um, my friend Bernard Lachlan, on the on the night Franco died, which was the 20th of November, 75, was on the Ramblas with, with a friend who was half Catalan, half English. It bumped into another friend who said, I'm going to this beautiful village in the mountains for, for the 10 days in which schools and universities were closed. Bernard said, can I go with you? And then came back down afterwards saying, I have found this astonishing place because Ferrer was the last village. In, in other words, it was, there, was, it, there was no through road. It was like the end of somewhere. And the sense of driving up there from Barcelona was moving into a world that was enclosed, that, that was somehow or other safe, and that um, there was only one road in. And only one road in meant, meant of course, that, that you could see who was coming from for miles because of the, of the way the views were. And so Bernard decided, and his wife, you mentioned Mary Rogan, whom he later married, that they would go and live there. And they went and lived there the following year in the summer of 76. And they had a baby there in the house, in the village. The baby was born the following year. And um, even recently, someone said to me, are you one of the Irish people that had the baby? <laughs> <laughs> because this became a famous idea that you would have a baby in a village like that in 1976. And um, it became the village... Uh, be, the, the, there was something heroic about it. I mean, there was something mytho mythic, mythological about the people who came to live there, who came in what house, who came, who was, who was friends with whom, who came first, who spent a winter there, who settled down there, who bought a house there. So that all of that became part of a sort of folklore around Ferreira. And the problem I had was that I left altogether in 1978 to go home, I mean, to go back to Ireland. And I'd lost it. And I, I was, it was constantly on my mind that that experience of those three years, which was politically so rich, um, and also personally for me in so many ways so rich, um, moving between Barcelona and the mountains, getting to know a lot of people, trying to, trying to learn the language, trying to learn about the artists and um, the poets. And, um, also getting involved in, in a lot of, in a very good time. I mean, I had a very good time in Barcelona. All that was lost. And I didn't know then how much loss can nourish a fiction writer, that you lose a place. It happened with Thomas Mann, for example, that he lost mm. the place he was born in Lübeck. And then building it, building it became his, um, I suppose his ambition as a novelist, his first novel is, is entirely a way of recreating it. It's the same with Joyce in Ulysses, that he was not living in Dublin, but he remade Dublin. And so um, I had lost it and I felt bad. I mean, I felt, <laughs> I felt a sort of grief over it. Dublin, going back to Dublin was difficult. It, it, it is a damp place in the winter. And politically things were very bad. And um, so I began to recreate the experience in a novel. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. And um, well, I guess that, as you said, well, you started as a fiction writer, as um, uh, let's say, to remember, in order to remember um, a place that you had lived in the past. What challenges did setting uh, a novel in Ferreira in, in El Pallars, post to you? Um, I remember saying to a Spanish writer um, that I had a novel published in English that had not been yet translated into Spanish or Catalan. And he looked at me and said, is it una novela triste sobre la posguerra? <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, it's a novela triste sobre la posguerra. And he said, I don't think anyone wants to read that just now, just now in Spain. I don't think anyone wants to read that. Um, and of course, for us outsiders, we were fascinated by the Civil War, by the Spanish Civil War. And um, I couldn't read enough about it. And um, 
yeah, I was even more fascinated when I realized the sort of silences that had existed and still exist to some extent um, in villages and towns, but also in the wider community that people didn't talk openly and freely about the civil war. That um, it, it, it remained, I, I think there was a sort of trauma attached to it that meant that people were more content or, or more relieved to leave it to leave it to the past and not, not to think about it. So, um, so, I, so I don't think if I'd been a Catalan novelist, I would have written that book. In other words, that it could only have been written by an outsider. And of course, is about outsiders. Mm. And um, I, I was when I went back to Dublin. The only glamour, the only real colour in the city, came from the painters. That um, there were groups of Irish painters who were older than I was, who had all many of whom had lived in Spain, many of whom had lived in France, and there were people of great. In, 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 there were independent-minded people. They did what they pleased, and they. Um, produced work every three years, but they, they, they really were serious bohemians. And also people who were seriously literary, the painters loved reading. They hated talking about painting. They loved talking about poetry. And, uh, and so I began to watch them. I began to know them. And um, there, were, there were a few of them in particular that I thought, that I knew had lived in Spain and had lived in, in people who had lived in Barcelona, who had also lived in the South, and who, who had painted Spanish light, you know, and um, and I became interested in that as I became interested also in the group of Catalan painters who had not gone to Paris or had gone to Paris and come back, particularly Joaquim Mir and um, Isidre Nunez, um, that I would go on a Sunday morning down to the Parque Ciudadella in Barcelona and just look at their work. And, and if any work was in a private collection, I would try and go to see it. So I became interested in all that world of um, painting um, in Ireland and Spain. And, um, and so I began to reconstruct um, a life. It was like reconstructing, you know, I, I was rebuilding Ferreira. I was bringing my characters from Ireland to, um, um, to Spain, and I was also thinking about, um, you know, Catholic Protestant relations, mm -hmm. um, which was, you know, in other words, there were Irish things that connected to what had happened in, in the Civil War. We too had a Civil War, and especially in the North, there were, there were very serious bitternesses. Mm -hmm. And for example, if you were Catholic in the North, you, you didn't trust the police, and the police didn't, were immediately prejudiced against you. Well, this was something that I, you experienced immediately in Barcelona okay. and e even more, I have to say, in the mountains, because the police were really outsiders and, and they, they didn't speak Catalan and they, they didn't integrate in any way with the people. So there were all those tensions there. Um, and um, also, if you, we, we have no tradition in Ireland of anarchism. It, it simply doesn't exist as a political philosophy. Therefore, I was absolutely fascinated by it and, and even finding people you know, in the 70s, who were actually anarchists, who didn't believe in, for example, voting or property or any form of social control. Of course, I thought this was marvelous and um, I was interested in it. In other words, anything that was new, I was interested in. And um, the novel came out of all of that. Okay, okay, that's very good. And uh, now I was wondering, I mean, uh, we are, uh, as you know, a line of research, there is a line of research at the university, which studies the relationship between uh, geography and, and writing. So in what way do you think that landscape geography has an effect on the creative act of writing? Oh, I, I think it's um, really vital. Um, you, you, see, you see, I'm talking, I suppose, about Ferreira not simply as a built village, I, you know, I, I'm not just talking about buildings. I'm talking about the way um, at seven o'clock in the e evening, we'll just start with this. The April in Barcelona is the month of the swifts, you know, the birds, um, the swifts in the air. And that's in the novel, The South. So, so you start with the, the idea of what those birds look like. But when you go higher up into the Pyrenees, you actually can get birds of prey. I mean, eagles. I mean, you can say, someone said, there's an eagle. And everyone stops. Oh, my God, look, look, and the way the eagle, e eagle flies. But more domestically in the village, you get these um, house martins, crag martins. They're, they're all forms of swallows, really. 
and you, you get them absolutely frantic at around seven o'clock in the evening. Now, th this is, of course, the beginning. This is, this is really exciting. But what's, what's also exciting is the way in which um, agriculture developed. It, that the Pyrenees, the Catalan Pyrenees, for example, in the Palliars, it feels all rocky and barren, but it isn't. That there are really, that, that within, within, that there's almost, it's all about making valleys. It's all water flowing down. And once water flows down, a valley gets created, even a small valley, and that valley becomes fertile. And so you have agricultural life going on right in the middle of a mountain. And um, so, so that it isn't all rock, um, mm -hmm. I think it's vital that it's not all rock, that actually you, you can make, or you could in those years, make a living as a farmer in this very severe, rugged landscape with very long winters. And we had a neighbor um, in Ferreira, and we still do, who's, who's actually a transhumancer. Mm -hmm. Now, again, speaking of geography, the idea of transhumancing as, as one of the oldest things in Europe, of bringing your sheep up from way below, from right down in Yeda, bringing the sheep up in April, right up high, much higher than Ferreira into, into land that is um, communally used, and then bringing the sheep back down um, when the winter comes. So that all of that idea of the, of the ritual of the seasons, I mean, this is very important where the winters are long, and then the mm -hmm. summers are so short and so beautiful, and, and people want them so badly. So you say, I have the idea of sharpness of the seasons, the, dis the difference between the rugged rock of the mountain and the actual fertile agricultural land right beside it, the constant um, sound of water, because you're, you know, no matter where you are, there's a stream coming down, and the bird life, which is um, very rich um, in that area. So, um, you know, you're talking about the, the fact that, that you live in geography. Mm. And what I was trying to do was maybe make the place live in history a bit more than I felt it did. Um, but that you certainly, the geography thing was, was absolutely all around you as something that affected every moment of your life. You know, the, 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 the way in which, you know, um, e even the... Um, that on your way up there, your ears would pop. <laughs> you know, that you were moving into a geographical region where, 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 which was slightly unnatural, artificial. I mean, it wasn't unnatural or artificial, but it felt like that. Okay, good, thank you. And uh, if we, well, if we move to the short story, A Long Winter, well, The Long Winter is built around a Catalan family in a remote village in the Pyrenees, the mountains, right? How did the idea of writing about the Catalan mountain family come up? Um, every year as a sort of ritual, we went over the mountain to meet a man who owned the, the small garden next to our house that he didn't use. Now, if you're, if you're not Catalan, trying to negotiate with a Catalan about property. <laughs> it's really interesting. He just simply said, I don't want to sell it. I don't mind how much the price is, I'm not selling it. We said, but you're not using it. I don't want to sell it. And this, I mean, relations between us became very good because they were very clear. He didn't want to sell it. And we wanted to come every year again. And he'd say no, every year again. So suddenly one year he arrived in the village with his son, he was an old man, he said, I want to sell. And I want to sell it to you guys because you're obviously the people who come every year wanting to buy it. And we spent a day trying to negotiate the price. And uh, he was really upset that myself and my friend, because we speak English, would talk in English to each other. And he couldn't work out what we were saying. But um, he was very, he was, had a very particular price in mind. <laughs> and I think we ended up paying him the price um, that he wanted. <laughs> And there were, it, it was lovely because he owned lots of different pieces of land all over the place. And himself and his son in a big Jeep drove us to see these little pieces of land and keep it a forest. But actually what we wanted was the garden. So um, 
news spread in the village because himself and his son were, were, were very conspicuous when they arrived. And um, a, a man came up to the house and said, uh, that man, his mother was born in a little ruin that's in that garden. Go and look, there's a little ruin. There was a house there and she was born there. And she married over the mountain. And one winter when the sky was blue and the day was perfect, she had some sort of fight with her family, with, the, with her husband, and she decided to go back to Ferreira. And she set out on her own, walking over the mountain. And that, that day, as can happen in the mountains, the snow came down really fast. And she wasn't found until the spring. And I went through every possibility of writing that story. I mean, I wanted to write it as though these outsiders, these Irish people had mm -hmm. ventured into this place without knowing its history. And that this idea, this ghostly figure of this woman was haunting them nonetheless. And but the feeling was that finding out about this had really unsettled them because they realized they didn't know this place and they never would know this place because all these secrets were kept, or not even secrets, just memories. And so um, I did everything. And then I realized, just, just tell the story, just stop trying to, I had various ways of making it into a, you know, a story within a story within a story. And then I thought, just don't do that. Just write the story. And I was already writing a book called Mothers and Sons. And I realized mm -hmm. I would tell it from the point of view of the son. Okay. And um, I went up there in the winter to be there, to write the story in the landscape. So that um, things like, there's a phenomenon called La Barufa. And uh, in Ferrer is quite important, La Barufa, because it's important to know, is it snowing or is it La Barufa? La Barufa, as you know, is where the, is where the wind blows the surface snow. But um, the, also they were hunting at the time um, for um, pork and la. Um, and everything that happened, I put into the story. And, you, you know, the, uh, the idea that he would go out every day, obviously that's, that's invented. I mean, the, the whole story is invented. I just used the little story I was told. I made a much bigger story from it. And um, it, it was a time for me of personal loss in the sense that it was written after my mother died and after my brother died. And in, in a way, it's, it, it's, a, it's a way of finding, uh, it's a way of finding a vehicle or, or a system that I could write about that loss without having to write about it directly. And so there's a, probably an intensity in the story, the whole sense of, there's, there's also um, a feeling which, which wasn't ever true in Ferreira, but, but certainly what was true elsewhere of um, villages having big feuds, especially um, I had a friend who was working in the archives. If you look at the archives, huge number of little court cases, mm -hmm. local court cases about water, about animals, about any infringement of rights. It's as though people were so oppressed by this Franco system that they began to fight with each other in villages. Mm -hmm. And so there was, there was often talk of villages where one family hadn't spoken to another family, which of course was very Irish. And, but I realized in those mountainous villages, I'm talking about the 1950s, um, they, um, that sort of tension or pressure caused people to have little feuds between themselves. And that was an important part of the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you mentioned before that you were impressed as many foreigners uh, by the, the civil war. And actually uh, the effect of the Spanish civil war is another relevant element in your uh, stories located in the Pallars. How does, well, you are a historian, how does history or your interest in history serve to your aims as a, as a fiction writer? Um, I think there were times when I had to be very careful with that. For example, in that story, A Long Winter, it might have been very easy to have created a big background in the Civil War, that the, that the reason why the father was despised in the village was about the civil war. And I realized, no, no, that's, that's not true. That is not what, what, what is happening here. That the fights became local ones, the feuds, the difficulties about 
water, land, that, that, that the civil war was, was too big a question for this. And I needed to bring it, to, to make it more intimate rather than to bring in the large history. And I think this in, this in a way is, is an effort to think historically. It was what were the problems in a Catalan village in the early 1950s? And the civil war was too large to, to, to make it into an open feud between people. That the, the, that the civil war created silence, it created resentment, it, it created ghosts, but the open feuds would be about things much more, much more simple. And the simple things would be, as I say, water or just land or mm -hmm. animals. Um, but it's, it's always there, the sense, I suppose, of um, the Pagliar as being um, sort of not integrated. I mean, in other words, as you drive up along the, um, along the river valley, and say you're moving from Sort um, Rialp into Llavorsi, and then you turn right to go up into, into, the, into the villages. There is a sense of moving away from the world. But of course, when you realize, you read a history of the Civil War, you realize this was hugely contested territory in 1937. This was a battlefield. I mean, it doesn't feel like that. But then, then the, 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 the more you dig, the more you realize that, that um, villages were destroyed by the Civil War, that people left who never came back, that um, sort of, a sort of um, resentment or silence descended. But the other part of history I think that's really important is the history of industrialization. That if you look at those vast suburbs of Barcelona, you know, um, built in the 60s, you realize this is what happened, that this is why Ferrer was empty. That Ferrer was not empty because of the Civil War, even though Ferrer was taken twice in the Civil War, but that the big change that came to Ferrer was the possibility of finding work in Lleida or in, or in Barcelona. That, that the exodus was actually an exodus that occurred mainly in the 60s, when opportunities um, and you know the, the proximity of schools and and the proximity of hospitals and the, obviously the availability of work that the, the, those forces in history were just as important as say the large um question of the civil war mm -hmm. okay and mr toivin i mean uh, most of your uh, main characters in your fiction novels well those novels located in El Pallars, but it is also true for the novels like Nora Webster or Brooklyn. The main characters are women. Um, which is the, the... Do you think that women take up this central position, this central stance in the culture of the Catalan mountains? Um, which is the role of women? Yeah, um, the um, in a long winter, uh, the mother is alcoholic, and when I wrote the story, people said to me, "This is, you know, in the Pallars, this is something that no one talks about here. The fact that alcohol is so cheap, and that there's an incredible loneliness um, that if people are isolated, but that um, that that area, for example, has not." it was something that people weren't talking about the, the 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 problem that women were having with alcohol but but that's just a small thing i think the larger thing is is exactly the same in ireland and in the Pagliars, which is that um a lot of the time men don't talk much that um you know when, when i was growing up if there were women in the house they would be upstairs and they would be talking all the time interrupting each other they would be laughing they, they would find something really interesting to talk about whether it was just gossip or talking about clothes or if you went downstairs there could be three men in the room and they would be talking about some sporting event at the weekend and one would be saying and they could be talking like that either in catalan or in english and they would be just talking in those sort of <laughs> almost Beckettian sort of phrases. And if you were a small boy, if you were a five-year-old, a six-year-old, and you went in and you, you had two old men saying, 
Oh, que, que, que tiene molta feina, que tiene molta feina aquí, es que no sé. I just skip. This is the most boring person I've ever heard talk. And, um, you know, in other words, when a journalist went up to Sort, because they thought Sort would be an immensely happy village because of the, um, of, of all the money they had won in the, in the lottery. La Bruxa d'Or y todo eso. They found that instead, everyone they met said, no, es que tiene molta feina, es que... Um, 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 si se lo habrá puesto o un nadal o un mique, pero... O la que ve, puse, pero algo de eso es que es que tienen, o tienen feina, no, no, es que no, es que cabe y todo eso. Si eso, eso, puse, un diumenge, no sé, un pro, no, ahora no. And then, <laughs> I told you, but how do you make a novel out of that? Or what? Like, how would you break that down into constituent parts to make a novel? Um, so, I mean, it just, um, if it was the same in Ireland where you would have, you know, your, your your father or your uncle or your uncle's uncle's cousin will be saying, yeah, that goal, the first goal on Sunday, that was a good goal. And the other one would say, yes, but the second goal was good. Ah, oh, yes, it was good. And you say, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with these people? And on the other hand, you would go upstairs and then the women would all have something much more interesting to say. So, I mean, it starts as simple as that. It also is that I was brought up in a house full of women. But, um, but the, but, but, but the long winter is very much told from the point of view of a young man in yeah. the village who's gay and his homosexuality goes sort of under the story because it is it is an extra kind of loneliness because mm -hmm. even when he thinks that another guy has come who might be his friend his friend the other guy's not interested mm -hmm. so that you know yeah. the, the possibility true. of yeah. finding love it, it just just it just just goes so um I mean, I don't just write about women, but um, it, it, it is um, um, it is an interesting subject. Yeah, I yeah, see. Okay, uh, is there a certain determinism in your works? Are your characters prisoners of history? Yes, that that I, I think that's the case in a long winter, where it is almost written as as you would write a ballad, and it is almost as though everything has already been decided. And that the weather itself, the geography, as you said, as you call it, I mean, the weather itself has dictated how these people will end. And that it isn't as though anyone has any possibility of escape, even though the brother who's gone to the Millie might seem to have escaped. In fact, they're not telling him, they're not giving him the news, makes him a sort of prisoner also. So, yes, I think in that story, there is a... Um, it is closed, uh, as you say, it is, it is determined. It, it is very bleak story in that sense, that there isn't an escape route for anyone. Yeah. But I think there is another story, um, which, is, um, which, which is called Summer of 38. And um, that story is also set in the Pagliars. And, and in that story, there is, a, there is an escape route. And um, one of the interesting things about the Pagliars is because it's, um, so, so scantily populated, it, it, it's really ripe territory for an historian because um, you can really, and there's a man called Manuel Jimeno and he's, he's he, he, you know, he might be called a local historian in the sense he's written a, a number of micro histories. And because he worked for FEXA, because he worked for the electricity board, he, he was needed in villages, he would lose their electricity and he would be desperately wanting to come. People liked him, people trusted him. His parents were not involved in the Civil War. He had no dog in this fight, but he was a great listener. And what he wanted from people were not anecdotes, but facts. And every fact he needed to check. And he began to create a history of every killing in the Civil War in the Pagliars. And I think this book is, a, is an absolute blueprint for historians working in a place of trauma. Um, and his tone is so calm and his interest in facts is really so overwhelming. So I, I, I went to see him and um, this is now got to be 15, 15 or maybe even more years ago. And um, it was a Saturday evening and we were in La Pobla and um, he just casually told me, you know, it's very odd about that summer of 38 because, um, the, because the fascists didn't have much to do for about a month. And they all came from the south or from Castile or something. A lot of them had guitars. And they had parties in the evening. And you would be very surprised who went to those parties. And he said, recently, a general or 
big big figure in the in the fascist in the fascist army was invited back to um, the Pagliars to, sh to show Manuel where certain things had happened. And as they were walking along the street in, in La Pobla, he met a woman and she was, he was 75 years old. The woman was too, and she was local. And they stopped and said, hey, hola, que, que pasa, que mira todos los años. He thought, and obviously they knew one another from the summer of 38. And he saw this as one of the ironies of history, you know, that things were not black and white. That, uh, you know, they, they became black and white and they had been before, but just with a small window. Mm -hmm. And of course, the minute he told me the story, mm -hmm. I said, wow, that's a story. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and so I wrote the story, Summer of 38. But in that story, there is, there is a sense that Monse in the story has agency, that she's able to work out what to do, that she, you know, that it isn't as though she's a prisoner of the civil war, that she, that there is an escape route for her. And the fact, which was a big, sometimes you find a big moment as you're working of a sort of an opening, an emotional opening that might also have implications for the wider world when you know, she marries a man who's not the father of her baby. Mm -hmm. And he knows that, and she knows that he knows that. And yet he forms an extraordinary bond with this child. That he loves this little girl. He really wanted to marry Monsi. He just wanted to marry her. Now that he's married to her, the fact there's a baby, he just, he fills him with, with absolute delight. They have other children. But mm -hmm. that girl and, 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 the, and the father, as it were, have a bond. Now, that seems to me to be a sort of a, a, an attempt to create an image, that open space. Um, whereas in a long winter, the space is all closed. So in a way, one story is a sort of reply to the other, saying that, you know, that there is a possibility of finding images mm -hmm. in open space. OK, good. OK, uh, well, look, yesterday I, I, I heard uh, an interview on the radio and, and I thought of you. Um, it was an interview uh, of a, mu a musician, a Catholic musician, a very well-known Catholic musician, who said that he was no longer creating music because he discovered that silence has more nuances than music and words. How important is for you silence is? Um, I think you work out of silence in the sense that the most interesting story you're going to tell is one that has not been told before. <laughs> and that, that idea of people holding stories in, not saying things. I, I, I think the form of fiction, fiction itself, is designed almost as a way of revealing secrets. In, in other words, you can show what someone is thinking and then you can show what they're saying. And you can see the distance between thought and speech. And of course, that is the whole, the whole idea of um, so much silence being preserved. But, but I also think if, if language is being used properly, it has to have a sort of undercurrent of silence. We must remember between each word on a page, there is a little white space silent. Between each line, there's a little white space silent. The reader in general, but this is before audiobooks, the reader read silently and so you, you have all this you have all this stuff but as opposed to the musician part of the part of the interest in the thing is breaking the silence is, is opening opening space is finding an image that soars above silence and so um and there are times when silence can be poisonous um and there are times when it could be necessary but um, yeah, it's a lovely word, silence. Yeah, very interesting. Well, uh, very often your fiction act as a sort of mirror game between your own world, your island, and the locations you choose in your stories, for example, in this case, Opalars. Would you think that your books set in Opalars could be read as a sort of intercultural experience? Um, yes, I suppose um, the, the, the idea in Ireland of um, a sort of literature of loss, 
that that um well i found when i when for example when i read um the work of of maria barbal that that I, that, I, that, I, that i found a sort of kindred town a, a, a sort of a way in which she allowed um certain ordinary people to have a sort of um I suppose a glow or, or a sort of um a sort of light in them that would emerge but um yes i suppose that ireland just just let me think about this for a second um I, i'm thinking about um the place where two languages meet so that in barcelona you go into a shop and you're never sure wh wh whether it's you know que vols or que quieres or that you know the, the two languages meet and in Ireland this is slightly different but there are times when especially someone of the older generation is talking and you realize they're translating from Irish that they're using um, a diction that is, is nourished by two languages so that you have that idea of um, that, that, that language is culture as much as its nature that, that it comes courtesy of history and that it comes also as oppression and that it's deeply politicized and um the the other thing i suppose is um the way in which people in ireland are guarded that thing i was talking about earlier the way that men speak but but i mean that w the further you go into the mountains the less people are likely to tell you and that people are careful and there's a watchfulness and um I know all that from Ireland. I recognize all that from Ireland. And um, I suppose it's also, um, um, there, there, I mean, there are obviously are great differences, but the fact that such a long winter in the Pyrenees and such a long winter in Ireland, and that you have ice, that, that you know, the, the road can have ice on it, which is in Los Angeles, is an unimaginable idea, but that, 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 the, that the road can be dangerous, that you can suddenly, you know, that the roads freeze um, and that the seasonal thing really affects people's minds. In, in other words, you get a great, you can get a great melancholy in the mountains mm. um, that comes from that seasonal, from the scarcity of light. And the scarcity of light in turn gives a sort of watchfulness. And you can certainly get that in Ireland as you can get it in, in the Pallas. Mm. Okay, interesting. Well, I have many questions here, but I see that I have to give some time to the to the participants if they would like to ask uh, any question. Just a last question. Uh, well, I think that Opalars is still a source of inspiration to you. Um, can you tell us something about the short story you have just written and which is not published yet, The Catalan Girls? Um, in 1988, um, I decided I needed a small studio in Barcelona. Which I couldn't afford, but I went looking anyway. And uh, in the line for his tiny studio in Barceloneta, in La Barceloneta, were three women who were Catalans, but they had lived most of their lives in Argentina. And they had decided, the three of the three sisters in their 60s, to come back after all the years to live in Catalonia. And I only met them for really five minutes. We were waiting to see the apartment. I never met them again. The story, which is, which is very long, I mean, it's 100 pages long, is describing why they went to Argentina, what happened to them in Argentina, why they came back. And of course, the problem I had was when they came back to Catalonia, there was only one place I could take them, which was to the Pallars. And so they come to the village, which is below Ferreira, which is the village called Burg, where one of their aunts has left them a house. And it's set in the contemporary world where, you know, there's the Festa Major de Burg and there's the summer and there's all the events that I know, you know, from, the, from, from being there. And these three women come back in one of those summers before the pandemic. And uh, they're, you know, that, so, the, so, so that's the story. And um, it's, um, I suppose it's another story uh, about migration. Yeah, and about well, moving from uh, one country to another. Actually, you are very interested in the um, emotional and physical exile, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. And the, but also the idea of homecoming. The idea then of um, how much you lose or you know you lose when you come home because you realize that you have changed and that the place has changed and that somehow or other you cannot simply refine um, a location or a time that um, even though geography is meant to be stable, 
it's actually not stable once it comes up against memory, exile, and experience. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, so would you mind if we give some time to the to the people following this sure, conversation? Let's if they that. would like to ask you something, well, uh, I would like you just um, uh, thank uh, you for for the time you have spent with us. It is very interesting. Well, you know that I have many, many, many other questions, <laughs> and I hope that sometime uh, I am able to just to ask them to you, yeah, in a longer conversation. Okay, so um, if any, si algú dels participants vol demanar alguna pregunta al senyor Toivin, aprofiteu ara a través del xat i li passarem la pregunta. Uh, while people are writing, you know that you are uh, a person who is very appreciated here in Catalonia. Oh, you? well, thank you very much. That's great, that's amazing, that's great. Alguna pregunta? Yeah. Es para las seves obras, la natura cultivada. Well, let's see. Here there is a question. Uh, says, uh, Mr. Toivin, which part of landscape are you more interested when you write fiction? The civilized uh, nature? Or, I don't know the word that in English. Uh, yeah. Cal yeah. Cultu uh, culturalized. Question. Um, um, I wild think, nature. Yeah. Yes, I think the Pallars, um for a fiction writer is interesting simply because how just how wild parts of it are. That um, I have friends who are who are big excursionistas, and to go on excursion er, starting early on a Sunday morning, and find yourself walking down, uh, uh, you know, an opening between two 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 mountains that is filled with huge huge boulders. And the sun is high in the sky, and they're, the only thing you're going to see are some eagles sometimes, but everything else is rock and stone, and, and it is fierce, and it could be the moon. And um, what's lovely is eventually, you know, that you're going to come back down into Esteri or one of the other villages, um, and you're going to have a beer and you're going to be tourists all around. And it's going to be that sense of the church, the hotel, you know, the bar that we might call civilization. And um, in the mountains in the summer, there are really good classical concerts. So you go into one of the beautiful churches and you find that, you know, you're listening to medieval music or you're listening to classical music. So I'm talking about the idea of both, the, the, the idea of Catalan culture on one side and um, the sheer wildness and the sheer brutality of the mountains on the other. And the idea of working with the two, that, that, that you know, one as not necessarily a shadow or substance, but both of them a substance. So um, the two things interest me. Mm, okay, thank you very much. Um, any other question? Let's see, while people just driving. Does every family have a secret, Mr. Toibin? Um, no. I say that because uh, many of your stories uh, that are there is a family and, and a secret around this family. See, I think with secrecy that I think the moment when you become fully human, a, you're aged about four or five, and your father or mother says to you, do not tell your aunt about this and you realize at four or five that you someone is going to visit the house and there's something you mustn't say <laughs> and but once you learn that you learn to enter into the conspiracy uh, surrounding humanity that in other words there are things we don't want other people to know and you must not tell that to somebody else and you learn you know with your friends like don't tell on so and so you know so and so has you know, so that idea of not telling then feeds into the idea of fiction, which is breaking that, breaking, breaking that glass and saying, I'm telling. And um, of course, what you're sometimes working from is um, truth is, is, I mean, fact is, is you're working straight out of things that happened. Um, and um, 
when I wrote A Long Winter, there, were, there was a, and it was translated into Catalan, um, there, there, there was a piece on television. And um, then I was walking one day and, and I was in the market in Sort, and a man stopped me and was saying, are you the man that I wrote the book about that poor woman? But he didn't know, I, mean, I couldn't explain to him that it was fiction, that I had invented it, that I had, you know, that he said, well, who did you interview? Like he said, because I was one of the group that went looking for her. And I mean, this was, in other words, he was talking to me 60 years later. You know, this was, a man, this was a man, maybe he was in his late 70s. And he wanted to know why he hadn't been interviewed for the book, you know, because he was there. And I was saying, well, you know, and he said, he was impatient at the idea that I had not stuck to the facts <laughs> and i was impatient with him because i said no it's made up it's it's a novel and so um um in, in a way you know that writing fiction is always about telling secrets breaking silence and um you know just moving one step beyond i suppose what's what's a sort of decorum surrounding what we keep to ourselves okay thank you Anybody else is going to take the chance? Algú més vol aprofitar per fer alguna pregunta amb el senyor Toibin? Català o en anglès directe, com vulgueu. I think they're all shy. They are all shy. Yeah, well, that's... Is there anybody who is not shy? Algú que no... que vulgui demanar-li alguna cosa sobre les seves obres, sobre les... Oh, uh, how has Pereira changed a lot today? Well, I suppose the first thing is that, it, 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 um, that there are no abandoned houses anymore. You know, it, it's not um, like that anywhere, really. And um, so um, I think things are very expensive. And uh, But, um, you know, the sky in the morning hasn't changed. And you, I'm talking about, you know, eight or nine in the morning when the sky is so pure and beautiful. And... Um, you get those days in July and August um, when something extraordinary happens, when you realize that a pressure is building in the air. And, and this is where geography, a pressure is building in the air. And even though it's a beautiful day, something is going to break and you get the most astonishing thunderstorms. Um, and um, this is in July and August. And, and then everything clears again. And so you, so you, you really live in weather still there's a there's a new center of arti natura in the village, which has made a big difference because it brings outsiders in. And Freire has always been a great place for outsiders. And of course, the pandemic made a difference in that it stopped the Festa Major happening. And Freire has a famously good Festa Major because, of course, people really care about music there and get great bands and it's great. I mean, there really is a fantastic Festa Major. And um, so um, it's changed in some ways. But the um, the sky hasn't changed, and the view hasn't changed, and this and um, I suppose what I love most are the small birds. The um, at around seven, eight in the evening, just frantic bird life um, in the air, and um, so it's all it's it's really beautiful. Okay. Um, the same Isabel says, is that good or bad? Well, you, you always feel that property prices should be low. <laughs> that, uh, property prices going up is awful because it means people don't have a chance. And, uh, but it's um, other changes, of course, are for the good. You know, um, yeah, I mean, other changes are for the good. I mean, for example, you know, there's broadband, which would have been unthinkable before. The idea that it, villages in the mountains would get those, those facilities that that is, that is unimaginable but that's but that's all there that's yeah that's all. gracias isabel anybody else say the last chance <laughs> <laughs> never be another yeah that would never says okay i was i was going to ask you sometime during our conversation about the influence that poetry and painting has in your fiction but i think that when we listen to you when you explain these landscapes, I think it is so clear that poetry and painting is uh, is important for you. Yeah, yeah. That um, 
and music as well. And, you know, and it, it was, you take what you can from anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. See if you could get the uh, to, to, to get what you're whatever you're writing to work. Yeah. Okay. So um, there we go. Algú més? Algú més? Vol demanar alguna pregunta? Bé, si no hi ha res més, només ens queda que agrair al senyor Toivin aquesta, aquesta estona que hem passat junts, que segur que ens ho hem passat molt bé, jo almenys ho he passat molt bé, estic segur que tothom ho ha pogut gaudir i bé, agrair-li en nom de, del grup de recerca, de l'organització, de la càtedra Verdeguer, doncs la possibilitat que ens ha donat de poder establir aquesta conversa amb vostè durant, durant una hora. I moltíssimes gràcies, de veritat. Ok, well, thank you very much and thank you very much everybody for listening. And, uh... I gràcies als participants. Uh, moltes gràcies. Recordeu que és la primera uh, sessió d'aquest cicle, són tres, i per tant us convidem a, a seguir el cicle sencer, si us ve de gust. Moltíssimes gràcies i de veritat, senyor Toivin, moltíssimes gràcies, ha set molt interessant. No sé si pot llegir els, el xat. Uh, sí, sí, sí. Uh, sí, doncs... Uh, sí. La gent li agraeix doncs, eh, l'estona que, que ha passat amb nosaltres. Okay. Moltíssimes gràcies i d'acord doncs, ens veiem eh, a la propera sessió. Moltes bueno, gràcies sí, a tothom. Gràcies a tothom. I moltes gràcies, senyor Toivin. Sí.